All right, everyone. Hello. Thank you for being here. I am going to call uh, the Committee for the Revision of the Penal Code into session, and we're very honored to be joined by uh, Governor Newsom. And uh, Governor, we'd be thrilled if you would say a few words. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for agreeing to do this. Thank you to the former governor, Governor Brown, for inspiring uh, this subcommittee of the Law Review Commission. Uh, and also, thank you to legislative leaders here that helped support the appropriation uh, to advance this cause. Uh, interestingly, um, I have long intellectualized the importance of this kind of convening, but never imagined being in a position that I am on a weekly basis, particularly through the parole process, to see firsthand the disparities uh, that need to be pre uh, presented uh, to the public, I think, in a much more earnest and forthright manner. Uh, the exploitation uh, on both sides, often, of the exceptions does not tell the entire story uh, of the normalcy that's taken shape as it relates to the sentencing uh, of people all across the state. Uh, it is jaw-dropping, uh, including today. I think we have, Kelly, after this meeting, uh, we'll be meeting, doing our weekly parole, people getting 90 years to life, uh, for attempted murder, people uh, that I'll be paroling after just 18 years for second degree murder. Um, it is remarkable, uh, the disparity that I see, the opposition from local DAs, the support uh, uh, in other cases from local DAs, the remarkable uh, complexity that you have to unwind of sorts. Uh, I will spare you uh, what is self-evident, and that is the deep racial overlays and the economic, socioeconomic overlays that often determine the fate of uh, so many uh, in our system. But regardless, we have to meet this moment. And I'm just here to say I'm happy to give cover uh, to the extent aid. I don't know that I could provide comfort. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I am here to encourage and enliven. And, uh, and I'm not naive. I mean, I have been a student of this. I've seen up close the practitioners and a few members of my family deeply involved in aspects of this, not just a father, but other members uh, that have long desired to see us do more and do better uh, and seen them fall short uh, because of organized opposition. So uh, no one walks into this uh, without uh, the understanding of the enormity of the task, particularly at a time when a lot of folks uh, are looking to the next election uh, to potentially set a different course. Uh, for this state and have a different conversation. Uh, but I am encouraged by the momentum. I'm encouraged uh, by uh, your uh, participation uh, and your resolve and just want you to know that uh, we're watching this and uh, we're very, very appreciative of each and every one of you. Thank you very much. We're really appreciative of your leadership and uh, help with this project. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And that concludes. You can now move on to the real work. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for kicking us off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, all right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I was very glad that the governor was able to, to come by and, and say some words that he has said to me uh, privately, but also to encourage us to really think broadly, ambitiously about our work here. I'm excited for what's ahead. Um, just to give us a, um, an idea of where we're going today, I would like to go around and just do some quick introductions. Um, then I'll say a few words about where I think uh, the commission should be going. And then uh, Professor Haney will give a presentation and answer any questions that everybody might have. Um, and then we'll have a period for public comment. All right. So, uh, Judge Espinoza, do you mind starting? Uh, and I guess a note of protocol, if you would push the white mic button in front of you, because we're being live streamed. Oh, yeah. All right. You guys can all move down one. 
Good morning. My name is Peter Espinosa. I'm the currently employed by the Department of Health Services in Los Angeles County as the director of the Office of Diversion and Reentry, work that is focused um, on criminal justice reform in Los Angeles County. I'm a former Superior Court judge, um, 25 years, including four years leading the um, criminal division. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I am Assemblymember Sydney Kamlogger, representing the 54th Assembly District, which covers Culver City and Central West South Los Angeles. I sit on the Assembly Public Safety Committee and also chair the Select Committee on Incarcerated Women. Um, hi, I'm Nancy Skinner. I'm the State Senator from Senate District 9, which is the East Bay across from San Francisco covering Richmond, Oakland, Berkeley, and uh, many other cities. I chair the Senate's Public Safety Policy Committee. I also chair the Senate's Public Safety Budget Committee that oversees corrections in the courts. And uh, I'm very um, honored to be on this uh, body. And I um, have many, I'll, I'll call it both, uh, eye-opening and fond recollections of Governor Brown while I've been in the legislature and while he was governor, holding up the penal code when he became governor the first time, and then holding up the penal code that uh, when in most recent years. And he, he then described in his estimation that this growth in pages reflected the growth in our incarceration population per capita. He also famously talked about his own regrets for being the architect or one of the architects of the change of basically removing judicial discretion in almost all of our uh, sentencing um, areas regarding a whole, a huge host of crimes. So uh, while I remember very many times his discussing it, we have yet, either as a legislature or the state, for the last 40 years, really tried to look at it comprehensively, so I'm very glad to be part of this. Thank you. I'm Song Richardson. I'm the dean of the University of California, Irvine School of Law. My entire career since law school up until the present time with my research has been studying the criminal justice system, both as a criminal defense lawyer, as a state and federal public defender, working at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, doing capital habeas work across the country, and now writing about criminal procedure and criminal law, and teaching criminal procedure and criminal law with a focus on race uh, and racial disparities within the criminal justice system. So I am so honored to be in the company of the remainder of the members of this commission, and I look forward to the important work we'll be doing. Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, Carlos uh, Moreno. I'm from uh, Los Angeles. Uh, like Judge Espinosa, I served uh, in the trial courts in Los Angeles, beginning in the Compton Municipal Court for seven years, four years on the LA Superior Court, and four years on the uh, federal court, Central District of California, uh, ending my judicial career with 10 years on the California uh, Supreme Court. Uh, more recently, I was appointed as U.S. Ambassador to Belize, where I worked on a number of criminal justice and court reform issues down there. I'm currently a uh, special master and neutral with an outfit called JAMS. Thank you. Barbara? My name's Barbara Gall. I'm the Chief Deputy Counsel of the Law Revision Commission, which is the um, agency that uh, this committee is within. I've been uh, with the Law Revision Commission for 25 years, and um, before that I practiced civil litigation with two different firms and clerked for a federal judge in San Francisco. Thanks. Brian? I'm Brian Hebert. I'm the Executive Director of the Law Revision Commission. Um, as Barbara said, the decision was made by the Governor's Office to propose that this entity be part of the Commission, so we are wearing two hats now and uh, providing staff support for both bodies. Um, I've worked for the Commission uh, since I uh, graduated from law school in 96. Um, 
I should add that I didn't uh, mention when I gave the brief agenda that Brian will be walking through some of the administ administrative matters after Professor Haney. Um, I should also add that one of our members, uh, John Burton, uh, could not be with us today, uh, but he will be in the future. Um, so I just wanted to mark that. Uh, if I could make one more point. Um, Barbara and I have a lot of experience working with the commission. Neither one of us has much, much experience with criminal law. Um, staff on the Law Revision Commission, te we tend to be generalists because we work on whatever topics the legislature refers to us. So as part of the, the trailer bill that created this committee, we were authorized to hire two new attorneys. Our focus is to hire um, people with subject matter expertise. Um, the, one of those people is here today. He's here as a citizen because his, he hasn't yet reached his start date. Uh, and that's uh, Tom Noswich, but I, I think, Tom, if you want to just talk a little bit about your background. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm Tom. I, uh, so yesterday I was a prison law office in Berkeley. Uh, before that, I was a public defender in New York City and New Orleans, and I clerked for a judge in New York as well. Uh, but I did go to Berkeley and Stanford, so I'm a strong California fan for the support there. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Um, so uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes to explain where I think we're um, going. I am truly honored uh, to serve with you on this committee. As you know, our directive is broad and ambitious. We are to study California's penal code and develop recommendations to the governor and legislature that will simplify and rationalize the substance and procedures of criminal law in California. I believe our guiding principle should be to develop policies that maximize public safety and fairness while avoiding unnecessary, cruel, and costly incarceration. You should know that my approach is informed by my time studying and teaching criminal justice policy at Stanford Law School. Part of my work involves representing people serving life sentences for nonviolent crimes under California's Three Strikes Law. My work has also involved collaborations with civil rights organizations, including LDF, um, several state and federal law enforcement agencies, including the United States Department of Justice, the Obama White House, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, and California's largest district attorney's offices. I also should note uh, that I have been a, a crime victim on more than one occasion, and that I bring that to the table too, I think. Um, I pledge that this committee will work collaboratively with stakeholders across the ideological spectrum. This includes crime victims, prosecutors in law enforcement, defense attorneys and civil rights advocates, formerly incarcerated people, and others impacted by the justice system. Our mandate to rationalize and simplify the penal code is intentionally open-minded, open-ended, in my opinion, uh, because as times change, different reforms may be called for. Today, however, our justice system operates in a manner that is far from clear and rational. California remains under an order from the U.S. Supreme Court finding that our prisons are so overcrowded that conditions amount to cruel and unusual punishment, and similar problems plague our county jails. The system was first declared unconstitutional by a federal court 25 years ago. This is not rational. If you are black or brown in California, you are more likely to be arrested, more likely to be convicted, and more likely to be sentenced to a longer prison sentence than a white person who committed the same exact crimes. This is not rational or acceptable. In California, over 30,000 people are released from state prison each year, and according to the state's own risk analyses, those who are being released pose a much higher risk to public safety than those who remain incarcerated. Indeed, the recidivism rate of people leaving prisons and jails is over 50% in California. This is not rational. It is not rational that California's largest mental health system is our county jails. It is not rational that crime victims often feel mistreated, unheard, and sometimes re-traumatized by the criminal process. I personally represent people serving life sentences for crimes, including shoplifting batteries, breaking a church window, and stealing three cans of instant coffee. These are my current clients. All are serving sentences longer than most murderers, and in my opinion, this is not rational. At the same time, we should recognize that California's crime rate is at its historic lows. Over the past decade, statewide crime rates for homicide, serious and violent offenses, and crimes like theft and drug possession have all declined. 
Many deserve credit for this underreported accomplishment, including a modernized police force, thriving state economy, and better services for vulnerable populations. I believe we can make California safer and reduce over-reliance on incarceration at the same time. It is my suspicion that our current laws are often counterproductive in protecting the public. That is, they make people less safe and unintentionally promote crime, and that is not rational. But we are not here to make recommendations based on suspicions, hunches, or anecdotes. That's how we got in this mess in the first place. We will spend our time hearing from experts, deliberating from our own experiences and judgments, and most of all, developing policies based on data and evidence. Finally, I thought it worth noting that in 1963, California created something called the Joint Legislative Committee for the Revision of the Penal Code, which has a similar ring. According to that committee's initial report to then Governor Ronald Reagan, its mission was to address, quote, the inadequacies of California's penal code, which has never undergone basic comprehensive revision since its adoption almost a century ago. The committee asserted that the state's justice system lacked, quote, a coherent or comprehensive statement of principle or policy. The committee's work is memorialized in several volumes of books, actually, which currently sit on my desk at Stanford, and it's almost two feet high. Um, members of that committee consulted with experts, examined available data, and collaborated with colleagues from other states. Then, unexpectedly, in 1969, after six years of deliberation and study, the committee abruptly abandoned all its work and laid off its staff. None of its reforms were adopted. According to one observer, when the Penal Code Revision Project was well on the road to basics and serious law reform, no one spoke for it, and it fell easy prey to the defenders of the status quo. For me, there are at least two lessons to learn here. First, it has now been over 150 years since California's penal code has been comprehensively examined as a system of independent variables. We still lack a coherent guiding principle and policy. Second, we must do everything we can to avoid the same fate as our predecessors 50 years ago. Thankfully, times are different. With this group of committee members and the support of the governor and legislation, legislature, real change is possible. Survey after survey shows that a clear majority of California voters and a majority of crime victims support criminal justice reform. They know the system is broken and unfair. The hard part is defining, designing solutions, and that's our job. So thank you all once again for your commitment and your service. I look forward to working with all of you. I am genuinely inspired and excited. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thanks again. Uh, with that, uh, we thought it would be helpful if we heard from someone who could give uh, an overview of California's justice system and justice laws, penal code, and mass incarceration. Um, and I could really think of no one better than Professor Craig Haney from UC Santa Cruz. He's one of the country's top experts on criminal justice policy. He's published several articles and books on incarceration in the United States, including as a co-author of this book, which was published by the National Research Council. He's also a hero of mine, um, and I'm very proud to introduce him as our first speaker at Witness. Thank you, Craig. Oh, and before Craig starts, I had asked Craig to uh, give about a 30-minute presentation with saving times for questions at the end. But I think, Craig, if it's okay with you, if folks have questions as you're going, to interrupt and please ask for clarification. Uh, first of all, it's um, an honor and, and a privilege to uh, address this uh, esteemed group as you uh, commence this historic and daunting task. Um, I um, was asked by uh, Chairman Romano to provide a kind of 40,000-foot uh, overview of what's happened to the criminal justice system in California over the last 30 to 40 years. Um, this has uh, actually uh, been my uh, professional life's work, studying criminal justice reform throughout the country, primarily in California because I've been a professor in the University of California for many years.
So it's just a system that I know very well. Um, and I think the other reason that uh, Chairman Romano asked me to speak to you is because he knows I've been a, an eyewitness to a certain extent to um, the transformation um, and, and, and sadly in many ways the negative transformation of the criminal justice system and the prison system in particular in California. I really do remember a time when I first began to do this work where there were only 19,000 people incarcerated in the entire state of California, which at that time seemed like an overwhelming number of people. And I really was, unfortunately, an eyewitness to the expansion of that system to the point, as many of you know, when right before it began to be reformed, um, there were almost 10 times that many uh, incarcerated in California's prisons. So I've seen that happen. There were times uh, over the last 30 to 40 years when not a week went by that I was not in a California prison somewhere, oftentimes, for better or worse, as part of a lawsuit challenging unconstitutional conditions of confinement. Um, I'm not here, however, to share war stories with you or talk about the bad old days, but rather to give you a sense, uh, an overview of not only what's happened in California, but what's happened in the United States in the last 30 to 40 years and, um, and the direction that we appear to be moving in, one sign of which is this uh, committee's commencing its important work. Um, uh, Chairman Romano uh, made reference to uh, uh, a book which I, along with 19 other people, had the uh, good fortune of being a co-author of. I want to talk a little bit about it at the outset and then I want to return to some of the conclusions that we reached at the very end of my presentation. Um, 20 uh, of the nation's uh, top uh, prison and criminal justice reform scholars were uh, um, brought together in uh, late 2011 uh, and charged with the responsibility of trying to understand uh, the causes and the consequences of what's come to be called mass incarceration in the United States. We called it here in a more neutral way, the growth of incarceration in the United States. We spent almost three years working together trying to understand what had caused the massive increase in the number of people incarcerated in the United States and what kind of consequence it had, economic consequence, consequence in terms of crime rates, human consequences, and consequences, as I'll talk at the very end about, consequences to the values, the democratic values of this nation. Um, we began with this graph, uh, a graph um, that you may have seen before. It's, um, it's oftentimes shown uh, in discussions about uh, the incarceration rate and its change uh, beginning in the mid-1970s in the United States. This is what the incarceration looked like in the United States from the mid-1920s until the mid-1970s. It is in some ways a remarkable uh, demonstration of what some scholars have called the stability of punishment. Mature systems, mature societies generally reach a kind of homeostatic point where they are punishing about the right amount. Uh, and once they reach that point, they tend to stay at that point. Um, there, there is relatively little dramatic change or shifting that takes place. Again, less mature democracies or societies sometimes have lots of fluctuations. But a country like the United States, not surprisingly, once it reaches the point where it's punishing just about enough, um, manifest the kind of stability in the rate of incarceration, as we did for a, a roughly 50-year period of time from the mid-1920s until the mid-1970s. However, from the mid-1970s on, and this is also a graph that you may have seen, something happened. Something happened in the United States, and that's really what the National Academy of Sciences Committee was brought together to try to understand and to try to evaluate the consequences of. The United States <clears throat> rate of incarceration doubled, doubled again and almost doubled again in the 25-year period of time from 1975 to 2000. Uh, it has continued to rise a, a bit and, uh, after 2000, nowhere near as dramatically or with as steep an acceleration as it did in the years between 1975 and 2000. This was <clears throat> a historically unprecedented period of time in American criminal justice history. It also made the United States an outlier uh, among other nations of the world with whom we typically compare ourselves. These are the rates of incarceration of other nations, uh, other democratic societies with whom 
we are often compared. And this then is the rate of incarceration of the United States compared to those other societies between 2012 and 2013. These are the data that provided the starting point of the National Academy of Sciences analysis. Um, and these are the, the data that we tried to understand, explain, and evaluate the consequences of in the several years we worked together. Evaluating the negative consequences of incarceration and this kind of massive outlier status in the world, we reached a number of conclusions, and one of them I want to read to you. We recommend a systemic or systematic review, much like the one you're going to undertake, of penal and related policies with the goals of achieving a significant reduction in the number of people in prison in the United States and providing better conditions for those in prison. To promote these goals, jurisdictions would need to review a range of programs, including community-based alternatives to incarceration, probation and parole, prisoner reentry support, and diversion from prosecution, as well as crime prevention initiatives. The committee made a number of specific recommendations about how to go about doing that, but I thought this was an apt recommendation because in many ways it sets out the parameters, although a bit more broadly than the undertaking that you're now commencing. We reached another set of conclusions, however, that I won't go into detail about, but they are also important because they establish a kind of context for what you are now about to begin. The conclusion that we reached is that the dramatic increase that took place in the United States over this period of time was an increase that, unlike uh, some revisionist history, was not driven by overwhelming or out of control crime rates. Yes, there was some increase in the rate of crime in the United States, but this rapid acceleration in the amount of incarceration that we engaged in was largely a set of or the result of political decision making. And in California, without singling out Governor Wilson, but simply because it is easy to illustrate with some of the headlines, um, this politicization of crime and punishment reached, in, in some ways, a pinnacle or a nadir in California in the mid-1990s. Um, the issue of crime and punishment was politicized. It had been before, and it certainly was after that. So this is illustrative. And Governor Wilson was not the only governor in California or governor throughout the United States who was engaged in a kind of lock them up and throw away the key politicization of crime and punishment. Um, but California was very much affected by it. You can see from this graph, it's a little hard to read, and I apologize to those of you who are far away from the screen. I'll try to walk you through what these numbers reflect. California, as you can see, got to the issue of rapidly increasing its prison population a little later than the rest of the country. M much of the country got into it in the early 1970s. We were a little late to the game in California, but, we, but once into it, um, we increased the size of our prison population as rapidly as anywhere else in the country and far more rapidly as any, uh, any state system anywhere in the world. Um, as you can see from this graph, the, the increase in incarceration, which is the dotted line in California, this is California-specific data, was not produced by a runaway crime rate in California. Um, relatively, some increase, a slight increase in the 1970s, but not a dramatic increase, and certainly not anything commensurate with the increase in the rate of incarceration that took place in the state. These were the National Academy of Sciences committee concluded, with respect not just to California, but states across the country, political decisions which were made here, driving the increase in the numbers of people that we put in prison, with, in California, not a particularly appreciable effect on the crime rate. And again, nothing, nothing commensurate with the large increase in the rate of incarceration. In California, we faced the problem of an unprecedented influx of people coming into the system for a, for a variety of different reasons, which I, which I won't go into. 
Um, but simply to say that the politicization of this process did have an impact. It had an impact on the laws that were passed. It had an impact on how those laws were being implemented. It had an impact on sentencing decisions and prosecutorial decisions. We tried as hastily as possible to grow the size of the prison system in California to keep pace with the uh, unprecedented influx of prisoners that had begun to occur in the late 1970s and throughout the 1980s. As you can see perhaps from this headline, since 1990, and this is a 1996 article, so between 1990 and 1996, the state of California constructed 10 new prisons, increasing the inmate population from 40,000 to 120,000 in a six year period of time. And even that extraordinary, unprecedented level of prison construction was nowhere near adequate enough to account for the unprecedented influx of prisoners. Difficult graph for you to read, especially those of you who are sitting at a distance, but let me walk you through it. The column on the bottom, the, the uh, lighter gray column, is the capacity of the system, the prison system in California, beginning back here in the 1980s. And you can see we were a little bit overcrowded in the 1980s, but the, the much taller red columns reflect the actual population of the prisoners who were in the California system. Right around here in the late 1990s, the system begins to operate at almost 200% of capacity. Not quite, but almost. And again, you can see it, this is an ever increasing uh, size of the capacity. So you see, even building 10 prisons in six years, we increase the capacity somewhat, but nowhere near enough to accommodate to the massive influx of prisoners. That's a dramatic graph in a way for people who are um, interested in reading graphs, but it translates into something much more dramatic on the ground. And again, these are scenes that you may have seen. Fortunately, they're not scenes that you can see now in California prisons, but they were present in the prison system in California really beginning in the mid to late 1990s, all the way up until around 2010. Um, day rooms in prisons throughout the state prison system were filled with bunks. Gymnasiums were filled with bunks. The bunks just weren't double bunks, but oftentimes they were triple bunks. People lived in conditions like this not for a week or a month or a year, but sometimes for decades. The system itself became extremely dangerous. A, a system that overcrowded has a difficult time maintaining order and security. And so, again, difficult to read, but this is the uh, rate of uh, or number of prisoner on prisoner assaults taking place in the system over time. Um, these are the 1990s when the system was overcrowded, as I've shown you from the earlier graphs. Um, the system itself was transformed. Overcrowding begat danger. Overcrowding begat violence. Overcrowding prohibited and precluded meaningful programming. And as we ended up arguing to the United States Supreme Court, eventually it precluded constitutionally adequate mental health and medical care for prisoners who were incarcerated in this system. It did something else. Um, in addition, prison systems, especially ones that grow as large as ours did, affect the rest of the state and the rest of the state budget as well. And so by 2004, and again, apologies to the difficulty of seeing the graph, by 2004, California was operating a prison budget on a per capita, ba per capita basis that was 32% above the national average, 2004. But a public school system, K through 12, that was operating at 5% below the national average. So we were among the country's leaders in terms of the amount of money we spent per capita on inmates, but we were below the national average in terms of the per capita, per capita pupil expenditure in K through 12. The shift in budgetary priorities affected funding for the University of California and the California State University system as well. 
So the inflection point occurred in the late 1990s when the State began to spend a greater percentage of the State budget on corrections than on higher education. And unflattering headlines like these began to appear in 2005, 2006, and 2007. Now, you might ask yourself, well, what did we get for this extraordinary expenditure that came at the sacrifice of our K through 12 and higher education system? Well, the answer, unfortunately, and in part because of the overwhelming overcrowding that the prison system faced despite these uh, exorbitant expenditures, the answer is we didn't get very much. Um, so these are recidivism rates. This is the re recidivism rate for California in 1999 to 2000, a recidivism rate of 61.1 percent. And it had improved a little bit from 2004 to 2007 down to only 57.8 percent. But where do we stand nationally? For both of those index periods, we were next to last. California had the second worst recidivism in the rate recidivism rate in the nation behind only Utah in 99-2000, and second worst recidivism rate in the nation behind only Minnesota in 2004 to 2007. And part of the explanation for why that might be the case, why California prisoners were faring so poorly once they were released from California prisons, is illustrated in this graph. So this is a, 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 a graph or a chart of the program or job assignments for 2006 releasees. Now, this is at the height of overcrowding before the reductions in population. And you can see that fully 49 percent of people who are leaving California prisons in 2006 had no program or job assignment whatsoever. Half of them came out of the California prison system never having spent one hour of time in a program, a classroom, or on a job. Some of them, of course, were parole violators, and they were only in for a short period of time. But also included in this 49.3 percent are people who'd spent months and years in California prisons and had literally nothing to show for it when they were released. Just at around the time things began to change, um, the magazine The Economist summarized the situation in California as follows. The resulting prison building boom, the rapacious bargaining by the prison guards union meant that state penitentiaries became the fastest growing major cost in the state budget. California's 33 prisons and associated camps therefore bear no small responsibility for the state's recurring budget crises and the resultant crunch on school and university funding, summarizing the graphs that I just showed you. Of course, things did begin to change. Um, I, I hesitate to say not necessarily by choice, but by force of the United States Supreme Court um, in a, a case that was decided, as I'm sure all of you know well, in May 2011. I was one of the expert witnesses who testified about the unconstitutional conditions of confinement, overcrowding being the principal cause of unconstitutional mental health and medical care in the system statewide. And this is when the United States Supreme Court ordered the system of California, literally in an unprecedented decision by the court, to reduce, significantly reduce the population of persons in its prisons. Justice Scalia, displeased with the decision, um, dissented, characterizing the decision as perhaps the most radical order ever issued by a court in the nation's history. Whether or not it was the most radical order ever, it was a significant order. Uh, it, it had a significant impact in reducing the population in California's prisons, and it was matched shortly thereafter by, if not a radical order, what has been characterized as two very radical experiments. Um, one, immediately in response to the United States Supreme Court decision, Governor Brown and the legislature passed AB 109, something that's come to be called realignment. And realignment, as you can see, had a, an immediate dramatic effect. Realignment, along with the court's decision to reduce the population, had a very dramatic effect on the prison and jail population in California. A few years later, again, as you're all familiar, um, another, in some ways, radical experiment occurred. Proposition 47 was passed. Um, reducing uh, the population of people in prison and county jails very significantly, 
by changing the way in which the penal code defines certain kinds of nonviolent offenses as misdemeanors rather than felonies, among other things which, uh, which were included in Proposition 47. Um, together, these things significantly reduce the population both in pr the prison system, and for the most part, this is a realignment reduction, although Proposition 47 also had an impact on the prison system. Um, and Proposition 47 had a very dramatic impact in reducing the number of people in jail in California. So there is, in fact, a net decrease in the number of people incarcerated in total in California. Realignment raised concerns among some people that, in fact, uh, the prison system or the, the size of the prison system might be reduced by simply transferring people out of the prison system and into the jail system. That appears not to have been the case. Um, the people who studied this very carefully, and I've mentioned here Lofstrom and Raphael, there are two people who have analyzed these data um, very conscientiously, um, have shown that for every one person who is released under realignment uh, it, from the prison system, excuse me, for every three people released from the prison system, um, it results in only a single in additional increase in the jail population, thus reducing the overall incarcerated population significantly in the state. And that's independent of the, of the significant reduction that occurred in the jail population as a result of Proposition 47. Uh, again, careful analyses of, um, of the consequences of this suggests that there has been no net increase uh, in crime rates in California. So this is the crime rate over time beginning in 2010 before these changes took place and carrying all the way up until 2012. This is the last pre-realignment month and you can see uh, no significant increase in violent crime, um, a slight increase in property crime, mostly car thefts, um, but not uh, even here, um, not appreciable, uh, especially in light of the very significant reductions in the number of people who are incarcerated in the state, both in its prisons and its jails. So it would appear that the two most radical, the most radical order and the two grand experiments, realignment and Proposition 47, are working. Um, and uh, to a certain extent, it is clear that they are. But I would be remiss if I did not also tell you that there are still very, very serious problems, and hopefully these are problems that your commission, if, if, if not addressing directly, will at least keep in mind as you, as you deliberate the various reforms that you propose. The first is for me to underscore for you that a prison system operating in 137.5% of capacity, that was what the Supreme Court told the state of California, the target percentage that it needed to reach, I bear some responsibility for that because I was the person who testified in the hearing that a good target number was 137.5% of capacity. Um, and when I did, uh, Justice Reinhardt leaned over to me and said, my God, why didn't you say 100%? And I said, well, Your Honor, I thought I would reach for something that was achievable. We were at that time operating at about 175% of capacity. So getting down to 137.5 seemed like a, a good target number. It was never intended to be the beginning and the ending point of the reduction in population. We were in an urgent emergency exigent situation and getting to 137.5 quickly seemed like the right thing to do. Over a long period of time, it is not the right thing to do. It is not the right number. Um, prison experts will tell you that any system that is operating at, at more than 100% of capacity is operating at a dangerously high and almost overcrowded level. And we are now in California just at, just having reached this. And so we are still operating a very dangerous, a very degrading, and a very damaging system. The changes are not insignificant, and this is going to be very hard for you to read, so let me try to talk you through it. This is uh, before the changes began to take place. When we had, at that time, 33 prisons. Five of those prisons were operating at above 200 percent of capacity before the U.S. Supreme Court's order in May of 2011. Fifteen of the prisons were operating at between 175% of capacity and 
We had only two prisons in the in entire state that were, that were operating at 100 to 130 percent of, uh, 37 percent of capacity. Um, no prison was operating at 100 or less of capacity. Now, if you fast forward to 2018, that's changed. Um, we have two more prisons that have gone online, and we no longer have any prison, fortunately, which is operating at above 200 percent of capacity. But we do have a prison that is operating at 175 to 200 percent of capacity, and we have fully 12 prisons in the state of California that are operating at between 137 to 175 percent of capacity. And again, I know of no corrections expert who would countenance that level of overcrowding. And this is after, this is 2018, after these reductions that I showed you earlier have been made. These are numbers. They, they are numbers that reflect a system that is still very overcrowded, that has become used to operating as a fortress-like set of institutions with control rooms or booths inside housing units that look a bit like this, that are fortified with weapons and implements of social control. We still have cells that look like this in our system and like this. We still put an unfortunate number of people in cages while they're awaiting appointments because there are no places for them to wait. Every prison in the system has these cages in the hallways where prisoners wait. We still have prisons online that don't look at all like places where human beings could or should be housed. They look like storage facilities for inanimate objects. We still have prisons online in California where prisoners exercise in individual cages, where they are chained together and where they look out onto the world um, from an environment where, given the sheer numbers of people that the system continues to deal with, very little good is happening to them inside. In addition to that, and, and Chairman Romano alluded to this earlier, the CDCR has become the default placement for the state's mentally ill residents, along with our county jails. We are not alone in this in California. This is a national scandal. Um, beginning in the late 1980s, prisons began to replace hospitals for the nation's mentally ill. Um, you can graph the decline in the number of state mental hospital beds that exist in the United States, a dramatic decrease between 1965 and the years following. This is, these are nationwide decreases, again, not just in California, although certainly they map changes that took place in California as well. If you put the increase in incarceration side by side with the decrease in the availability of state mental hospital beds, you can see a eerie parallel. I'm not suggesting to you that this number is accounted for entirely, the increase here is accounted for entirely by the decrease here, but I am suggesting to you that the people here who would otherwise have been, have, have otherwise had their needs addressed by a functioning mental health system now have nowhere to go but in here. And in fact, that's where they are, that's where they are nationally, that's where they are in California. As we sit here today, there are about 10 times as many people in, mentally ill people in prisons and jails as there are in hospitals, mental hospitals throughout the United States. If I asked you to design a place, an environment that was more ill-suited to the treatment of the mentally ill, you would have a hard time doing better than a maximum security prison. In California, as you all know, this has been an, a, the subject of ongoing litigation. I was first involved in the, the Coleman case, which eventually led to the Plata case and the United States Supreme Court decision. I began working on Coleman in 1991. And since that time, there have been over 100 court orders that have been issued in that case trying to reform and correct the unconstitutional system of mental health care delivery in the California prison system. Over that period of time, 
curiously, um, but, um, but factually, the number of prisoners, mentally ill prisoners, in the California prison population has increased percentage-wise. So this is the percentage in 2000, and this is the percentage that we are now facing the most recent data in 2017. An ever-increasing number of mentally ill prisoners in our system, in our prison system, and perhaps even more unsettling, an increasing number of people who are severely mentally ill. California mental health care delivery system in the, in the prison system distinguishes those who are most seriously mentally ill and they are what are called uh, enhanced outpatient or EOP care prisoners. And the number of such prisoners in the California system has been increasing from 2012. The last data we have is at the end of 2016. But you can see that there is an overall increase. Although we have improved the delivery of mental health care in our system, people are still severely mentally ill, and our state's prisons are no place for the especially severely mentally ill prisoners to be housed. It is an ongoing problem. It is a problem on which many of us have been working, um, and it is a problem that I think, frankly, can only be solved by creating additional alternative institutions for these people to go to be more safely and more effectively treated. There are other problems. Mental health care delivery is not the only one. I should also point out that uh, there is a cost-effective issue here. It's not only the wrong place to deliver it, but it's an extraordinarily uh, expensive place to deliver mental health care. A California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation crisis bed, this is where the most severely mentally ill are placed when they are in crisis, costs about $345,000 a year to maintain. This is in comparison to $218,000 per bed per year in one of our state hospitals. Still extraordinarily high costs. Less mentally ill prisoners in California are somewhat less expensive to take care of, but still $75.2,000 per average per year for each mentally ill inmate in the system to provide them with care. Care which I would argue to you, no matter how good we try to make it, is not adequate or commensurate to the care that they need. A community-based mental health bed, however, is $21.9,000 per person per year as opposed to a parole plus outpatient mental health treatment, which costs on average per parolee about $7,900 per year. The system, you heard the governor allude to this, Chairman Romano did as well, our system continues to be plagued by racial, extreme racial disparities. This too is a problem that plagues the criminal justice system in the United States. Based on 2001 incarceration rates nationally, you can see that an African-American man had one chance in three of being incarcerated in his lifetime. Uh, and that number has not changed appreciably. These are 2001 incarceration rates. The only thing which has changed by around 2010 is that the Hispanic incarceration rate has increased somewhat. The white rate, not at all. And again, you can see, if you graph, this is the African-American rate, this is the Hispanic-Latino rate, this is the white rate. It's increased a bit for whites, but nowhere near as dramatically as for persons of color. In 2017... I just have one quick question before you move on. Do you have similar graphs about the incarceration rate for black women and women of other racial groups? Yes, yes, okay, we do. Great. And I'm happy to provide them to you as great. well. In California specific, so these are national data. In California specifically, in 2017, 28.5% of the state's male prisoners were African American, compared to 5.6% of the adult male residents. This calculates into an imprisonment rate of an astonishing 4,236 per 100,000 people literally 10 times the imprisonment rate for white men, which is 422 per 100,000. For Latino men, the imprisonment rate in California, again, is 1,016 per 100,000. For other races, including Asians, 
314. The disproportions in the rate of incarceration in California are dramatic. Um, they remain relatively unchanged over the last 10 years, so that even though we have reduced the population of people who are incarcerated, the disproportions for people of color have not been reduced significantly. And again, and those, those disproportions exist for women of color as well. A prison, do you mean a state prison as opposed to county jails? Yes, those are state prison figures. All right, and, and it's regardless of the length of service or length, length of a sentence? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, those are all overall numbers, overall rates of incarceration. So the rate, I mean, the punishment could be anywhere from three years to, to life? Exactly, right. yes. The legacy of over-incarceration, um, which we have been committed to in our state, sadly, over the last 30 plus years, has ensured that reentry and community corrections remain works in progress. Um, I can say this even from my own town of Santa Cruz, which prides itself on having um, not relied heavily on prisons over the last uh, 20 to 30 years, trying to, uh, as best we could, resolve issues of crime and punishment as locally as possible. Um, Community corrections and reentry in Santa Cruz is a work in progress, and nobody in my community would suggest otherwise. I suspect that's the same for communities throughout the, 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 the state who have come to depend on prison over the last 30 to 40 years and now are trying to figure out an alternative way to approach problems of crime and punishment. Prison systems cannot be improved independent of the society that exists around them. I mean, this is something that I know you don't have control over, but I think it's something to be cognizant of as you begin your work. Um, a colleague, a former colleague of, uh, of uh, uh, Chairman Romano's and a, a friend and, and, and colleague of mine, uh, the late Joan Peter Celia, uh, made this observation. Uh, it is one thing to urge prison downsizing, but such pronouncements will be hugely counterproductive if policymakers act without giving serious thought to how communities deal with all the offenders who are released. I'm gonna go back as I end to the National Academy of Sciences recommendations. Um, I brought copies of, of this book uh, for members of, of, of the committee, um, and I would especially turn your attention to um, uh, a chapter in, 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 in the volume that, that actually is not as programmatic in any way as, as, the, as the rest. It's not data bound. Um, and it really represents an, un, an unprecedented um, deviation from what National Academy of Sciences committees ordinarily do. Our mandate on the National Academy of Sciences is usually to analyze data, to crunch numbers, to come out with uh, as sophisticated a set of statistical analyses as we can, and there's plenty of that in that book as well. But the members of the committee were so taken by the reflection that we engaged in over a couple year period of time about how our society had changed, not just in terms of numbers, not just in terms of the economics of it, not even just in terms of the human suffering that mass incarceration had brought about for the people most directly affected, for the communities that were most directly affected. But we also reflected on the way in which mass incarceration had changed our society. Uh, caused us, we thought, the committee did, to lose a sense of who we were as a society. And so in chapter 12 of this book, we did something, as I said, unprecedented for a National Academy of Sciences committee. We engaged in a values discussion. And I want to leave you with these four, these values that we came up with because perhaps they will be useful for you in your future deliberations. What we said as we began this was that in the domain of justice, empirical evidence by itself cannot point the way to policy. Yet an explicit and transparent expression of normative principles has been notably missing as the U.S. incarceration rates dramatically rose over the last four decades. Normative principles have deep roots in jurisprudence and theories of governance, and they are needed to supplement empirical evidence to guide future policy and research. And we came up with four of these principles. Drawing imp implications, to be sure, from the empirical research that we so carefully evaluated in the course of the two years that we studied it. The first one was something that we called parsimony. 
punishment, criminal justice punishment, should not exceed the minimum needed to achieve its legitimate purpose. Do not act if action is not necessary, if action is not is absolutely essential. The onerous weight of the state should not be exercised. Um, what uh, Yale Law Professor Robert Kober calls the violence of the criminal justice system should not be unleashed until it is absolutely necessary and only in those instances in which it is absolutely necessary to do so. And over the last 30 to 40 years, we thought, the National Academy of Sciences Committee thought, we had lost our sense of this. We were punishing oftentimes for no good reason and certainly punishment, punishing when we, punishing in ways that exceeded the minimum that was needed to achieve any legitimate purpose. A closely related principle was proportionality. Sentences should always be proportionate to the seriousness of the crime. The seriousness of the crime, not driven by the latest headlines, not driven by uh, some estimate of political benefit, but driven by a sober analysis ideally a sober data-driven analysis of the actual seriousness of the crime and the sentence proportionate thereof or thereto. The next one, the next principle that we thought this, our society had sadly lost sight of and that we needed to be reminded of going forward was something we called, for lack of a better term, citizenship. The notion that in a democracy, everyone should be able to, should have the capacity to participate as a citizen. And therefore, the conditions and consequences of imprisonment should not ever be so severe or lasting as to violate one's fundamental status as a member of this society. So that people should not have their civil rights taken away from them, certainly not have their civil rights taken away from them after they had served their prison sentence. Nor should they leave prison bearing the marks of imprisonment, should they be disabled by the experience that they had in prison. Um, that we should make sure that we use the time in prison to better empower rather than disempower people who'd serve time in prison. And the third and final one, again, somewhat elusive, but I think also important to remind ourselves that as public institutions in a democracy, prisons should promote, not undermine, the general well-being of all members of society. And sadly, we thought on the committee that the way prisons had functioned in the United States, and, and, and if, if you reflect on the uh, racial and ethnic disproportions I alluded to a few moments ago, perhaps the way they continue to function in California, we are increasing racial disadvantage. We are increasing economic disadvantage through the way in which we use the criminal justice system and the way in which we use our prison system. And that, in some important way, needs to be reversed. Prison should, at best, promote promote the general well-being of all members of our society. And so social justice ought to hover over the deliberations of this committee, along with all of the other kinds of calculation and doctrinal analyses that you will do. And on that note, I thank you for your indulgence, and uh, I will end. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Haney. I have a bunch of questions, but I don't know if you guys want to start off. I do have a, I have a question. Thank you first so much for that incredibly powerful and informative presentation and for all of your work that you've done in this area. Um, so my question relates to what you think we should be focused on when we think about the penal code. And the reason I ask it that way and, uh, is because so much of what you describe is the result not solely of the penal code, but of course law enforcement discretion, prosecutorial discretion. Um, and one of the things you mentioned during your, your, your talk was one thing that helped reduce the incarceration of, of people was changing felonies to misdemeanors, and that had an enormous effect um, because it can at least mitigate the discretion of of the executive branch. And I'm wondering what other types of penal code reform do you think might be where the focus should be to help reduce that since there's, because of the discretion I talked about? Well, I, you know, I think we've, we've seen the enormous impact both of realignment, not, not technically a penal code reform, mm -hmm. but, a, but a legislative reform. Right. 
um, and Proposition 47, a, 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 a penal code re reform. Um, and I think to the extent to which this is within the purview of this committee, continuing reforms of that nature, of those uh, uh, consistent with those kinds of reforms, re simply reducing the number of people who are at risk of being placed in jail and prison. I've been talking primarily about prison, but as you all know, jail, many of, many of the same scenes that I showed you from the, the state's prisons look as bad or worse if we were to go to the state's county jails. That, that kind of exposure, um, at least under, under current circumstances and in present conditions, um, it, it threatens to have a debilitating and indeed even criminogenic or crime producing effect. So anything and everything you can do as a committee to uh, adhering to the principle of parsimony, only when it is absolutely necessary to confine, confine somebody in one or another of those institutions. Um, it, is, it is outside of the scope of your committee, I know. There are, there are uh, many people working to continue to reform the prison system, to reform the jails, to exercise control over prosecutorial discretion, um, to introduce greater levels of accountability in law enforcement. Um, all of those things are very much works in progress. The, the more that can be done to limit the exposure of people to the prison and jail system uh, in ways that your committee, I think, can directly address, uh, the better. I have a question regarding the other end, the incarceration aspect. I've always been astounded about what it costs to house a, an inmate, and you presented some very compelling uh, numbers comparing that to the cost of education. We often see that. Uh, comparison uh, made, but what's the current thinking on coming up with alternative forms of, of incarceration that is still incarceration, whether it's camps or more minimum security facilities to protect uh, public and also uh, staff? Uh, is there any kind of movement in, in that direction? Some of the jails and prisons that I've visited over the decades are I mean, they're, they're very, very secure for a reason, but it seems like not every prisoner or inmate needs that kind of supervision. Yeah. For example, you know, I, I was a federal judge for four years and toured a number of minimum security facilities, uh, not necessarily uh, club feds, but there was one club fed. That seems to be a less expensive way of, of dealing with some of these uh, violators who are not, don't really require the kind of security measures you see at some of our more traditional yeah. prisons. So is there a trend to break away from the model prison that we've had think, for the last decades? It's a really good observation. I think it would be an exaggeration to say there's a trend to break away from, from it. Thinking, I think there is the beginning of some thinking in the Department of Corrections. I think the current head of the Department of Corrections um, it, He's heard the presentation much like the one I just gave you. Yeah. And um, to, his, to his credit, he sat through the entire presentation, uh, asked a lot of thoughtful questions, uh, and, uh, and I think under, understands uh, what, what some of the inertia is that he is working with. So we've got a system as large as the system in California. You know, we, the other mistake we made in addition to building so many prisons is we build enormous prisons in California. We made a decision to build prisons that hold two and 3,000 people. Right. Most, most state prison systems don't have facilities like that. Those facilities, you look at, for example, Salinas Valley, it's a, it's a massive institution, holds three, 4,000 people. It's very difficult to think how to decommission that, that facility or use it, purpose it for something different. It's, they're massive housing units. It, the emphasis when those things were constructed was security. Um, and they, there, there's relatively little uh, space for doing, an, doing anything else. The buildings have been created really to hold people right. and not really to provide services. I think the Department of Corrections is it, it, very slowly, this is I think like turning a battleship maybe, a very, very slowly beginning to move in a different direction and thinking about exactly the kinds of things that you're talking about. But I, you know, again, I, I don't I hesitate to say it's a trend or it's an initiative that they're, that they're undertaking, but I think it's something that they're very seriously thinking about. And so too at the county level. I mean, one of the things that realignment has done 
is it's forced counties to think about different ways of dealing with a jail population. As you know, re realignment in Proposition 47 now has people in county jails for longer periods of time than they otherwise would have, would have been confined there. So jails now have had to think about different ways of doing confinement, um, providing programming for people. When the longest you could spend in a county jail was a year, then you could perhaps justify minimal to no programming. But when somebody's doing three to four years in a county jail, then county jails have, throughout the state, have had to begin to think about creating alternatives to, to, to simple confinement. And many of them have begun to think creatively about how to do that. Thank you, good doctor. Um, I had a couple of questions um, but also, you know, we built, not only did we build these huge prisons, we built them so far away from where most of the folks who are being housed live. And so we sort of actually create a new culture of learning to be separated, you know, from your um, family, which does nothing to help your lineage. My question, especially in listening to the tenants that you shared, parsimony, punishment, proportionality, citizen, citizenship, et cetera, is, is there a role for subjectivity in all of this? And if so, what is it? And how do we create equity in it? Um, I always sort of go back to, the, to Judge Persky, who really sort of used judicial discretion in that case. Um, and as a result, because it was sort of inconsistent and not always seen, we don't generally see that kind of discretion, he was punished for it. Um, and the fear now is not to use judicial discretion because you don't want to be, you know, recalled. But there is a place for judicial discretion, and part of it does involve someone's either their bias or their subjectivity to seeing a person in front of them um, as an equal member of society. And so how do we sort of reinsert those notions back into not only this process, but back into the, the criminal justice system. Yes, well, that's it, it, it's a, it's a really thoughtful and, and, and deep question that, that re requires a hopefully thoughtful and deep response. I'm a, I, I think one of the things that we did over the period of time that I, that, that I, that I covered in, in, this, in this very broad overview is we not only increased the amount of punishment that we subjected people to, but we removed discretion and subjectivity from the sentencing process. Um, we did it in a, we did it in a, in a dramatic way in California where we went from an indeterminate to a determinate sentencing system, which, 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 had, which had some justification. Um, I, don't, I don't know that the people who were promoting that particular reform could envision where it led us. I don't think that's, it, that, that, that's what they intended when they changed the system in the way that they did. Nor do I think that they intended to have all of the discretion taken out of the way in which the penal code operated. So that judges were not allowed to essentially in our system, and I'm exaggerating a bit, but they're hardly allowed to exercise any degree of individual level of analysis in an individual case about issues like culpability, um, doing a finer grained analysis of the how and the why that somebody might have engaged in crime and instead are very tightly wedded to the penal code. They have a very narrow range of sentences which they can, which they can meet out. And if you're asking me personally, do I think that's a good or a bad idea? I think it's a terrible idea. I think we backed into it. I think we backed into it at a time when there was some sense that we needed to make everything equal and that all we cared about was the, was the severity of the crime defined and in as abstract a set of ways as we could without also taking into account that a severity of the crime has to take into account the subjectivity of the, of the person who's committed the crime, um, the reasons for it. Um, you know, there, there used to be, and some of you remember this, there was a whole area of criminal defense law which was called sentencing practice. You learned how to give a, a, a sentencing statement to a judge because the judge could, could in fact exercise his or her discretion over the outcome. Uh, public defenders don't do that anymore because there's really not, you know, there's really not anything, there's really no discretion to be exercised. They've, they've sort of lost the, the only, the only area of law where this is still done is in capital cases where 
you learn how to present mitigation because the issue before the jury is life or death, and there, mitigation and culpability is taken into account. But nowhere else in the criminal code is this allowed to be presented, and I think that's a terrible, a terrible mistake because it really it ends up being a kind of artificial equal justice, mm -hmm. but not really equitable justice. Mm -hmm. Follow up to that. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll let and someone else speak first. No, then my second was if you could be radical in thought, which I know might be hard for you. Um, in our work here as members, how do you think we could actually influence um, the triage that happens at the point of contact with individuals who are potential arrestees? So even before they touch the system. Because if you cannot even get into the courthouse, yeah. you have a better chance of not being traumatized. Yes, yes. I mean that's a, that's absolutely right. I mean, again, I've been talking primarily about prisons, but we all know the trauma begins long before prison. The system fails long before anybody gets to prison. Prison is sort of the final stage of the problem. It's the worst case scenario, but the scenarios that preceded it were, were not good ones either. Uh, as radical a set of alternatives to incarceration as possible, and by incarceration I mean jail custody as well as prison incarceration. I think we need systems in which that the initial point of contact, um, uh, law enforcement officers are trained as divergent, diversion agents so that they don't think the way they currently do, which is we take, they have one decision to make, do I take this person to jail or not? Um, and, and, and that's, a, that's a, a too limited a set of options. Partly that's the way they've been trained. Partly it's also reflecting the realities of the communities in which they work. Those are the only alternatives available to them. They either leave somebody on the street or they take them to jail. There's, there's relatively little in most communities in between. I think that needs to be radically altered. Um, so that they, they, need to make a, they, they need to make a very nuanced set of decisions which means they have to have a nuanced set of, of alternatives other than jail. Jail, I think, needs to be understood even by law enforcement officers as a failure, a failure of the system, a failure of my decision-making options because, you know, as you alluded to in your, or implied by your question, once you get into the jail system, half of, half of the damage has been done. Mm -hmm. The only question is how much more is going, is going to take place. Um, so, so that trauma needs to be avoided as often and as, in as many instances as it can, as it can be. Okay. Yes, Thank you. Really appreciate your presentation and just as a kind of one thing that occurred to me in watching it, um, that it's common in the last whatever period of time, say a decade, for either um, media, newspapers, and again, not trying to point to journalists, but just in general kind of a discussion here in the Capitol or by external that, um, that this has, we're in this situation largely due to the power of the prison guard union. And what, while I am aware and know of much of what you presented, seeing it so starkly today, I realized, hey, this stuff was all sent into place well before there was any large prison guard union. <laughs> and that certainly a consequence of it is obviously to have many, many people employed within the corrections department. And of course, if you are an employee of any, whatever the system is, you're gonna be looking out to try to protect your job. So, but it's been interesting to see how there is this f kind of blame or focus on those employees mm -hmm. versus on the public or those of us who actually approved the budgets to build the prisons mm -hmm. or enacted the laws that gave, that increased the sentencing or took away the judicial discretion. So anyway, I just thought it was worth Pointing that out, I mean, obviously, if as if any, if in the penal code changes that either are anticipated or adopted or just future things, as I think what we're, I think we're on a trajectory, hopefully, 
in California of actually um, would like the governor announced uh, prison closure and such, which the legislature had already directed in a plan under Governor Brown. But anyway, we're, we'll, hopefully we can see a sort of future where we're going to reduce the number of prisons and we're going to reduce the number of people incarcerated. And just like any disruption we make in an economy, we're also going to have to pay attention to how to address the employment of those people that we otherwise are employing. So that's a kind of a separate, but I think it's just worth um, thinking about. So that it isn't, so that we don't have the tension or conflict of feeling like we cannot meet the principles that you articulated and that these do not have to be in potentially in conflict with each other. Um, but now I wanna go back to um, some of the questions. So our Dean, asked you around what should we focus on potentially in this review and you indicated you know adhere to that principle of parsimony and I agree um, but I think if we look at the size of that penal code now um, you don't have to answer this right now but I think it's what are the ways to to try to address each single one of those changes to the penal code I think would be close to impossible for us. So what are the kind of broader, and now I go back to what my colleague, assembly member, um, mentioned is this issue of the discretion. So, and, and I realized in her description of the reaction to Judge Parsky that even that we have to think about how to design it to hopefully minimize those unintended consequences or negative consequences. Mm -hmm. But I guess the real question, and I'm speaking too long, but the question is, is sort of how much can we accomplish just through increasing that discretion versus the change, multiple, 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 multiple changes to so m much of that penal code? Mm -hmm. Well, this is not going to be helpful because my recommendation would be to, would be to do both. Okay, do both. Would be to do both. I, I, I do think that, that the, in, the introduction to principles of discretion, I mean, perhaps one way to approach it is not unfettered discretion, which none of us in the law like, but principle discretion, principles of the exercise of discretion, the kinds of things that, that, that courts might advert to in, in, in reaching sentencing decisions so that, it, so that judges don't feel like they're they're, they're, they're simply, they're, they're, there are no guidelines with which to operate, but, they, but that they have some, some framework for understanding how they should exercise their discretion. But I also do think that without, you know, without, without forcing you to go point by point through the penal code, that, that, I, do, that I really do think the reduction of the number of crimes that are punishable and the, and the length of punishment which are associated with these crimes is really at the heart of what you sadly must do. Well, I appreciate the answer only, I mean, it, I think it helps us understand the scope of the work. And I also appreciate the answer because as a legislator who has um, over the years carried many, many bills that are kind of one-offs, a change to this part of the code, and then again, another change to this part of the code, it does um, feel frustrating at times to have to be in that circumstance over, over you know, mm -hmm. 10 years, just a little change here, a little change there. Again, knowing that whole, that any type of changes have to be done in a very, we have to be very um, smart and wise about them, but it does seem to make a lot of sense to try to do that comprehensive review versus the one-off. But the other thing that I wanted to raise, which you got out in your, got out in your presentation, but some other comments, is that and actually it's assembly members, Kamlager Dove's comment that, so we have the charge to look at the penal code and hopefully we will do a good job at that and there will hopefully then be the changes. But given your data around who gets, I mean you didn't quite put it all up, but who gets stopped, who gets arrested, who gets convicted and then who serves, that I mean, what again struck me, and it's like, 
Okay, so crime is down. Some people say crime is down or would look at your charts and go, that's because they're all in jail, right, that we have such a high. But meanwhile, what your data also shows is that basically if you're white and you commit a crime, you're very unlikely to be in that, in within, reflecting in those numbers, so that you could be out there still committing crimes. And, uh, and that even changing the sentencing is not necessarily gonna affect these racial disparities. Certainly, we may have less people in, say, our jail and our state prison system, but unless we get at that other part that our, my assembly colleague would mention, we could still have this disproportional that doesn't really reflect in any proportionality as to who's committing crime. Yes. Well, well, I would say, I would just, I would agree with all of that. I would say equally important is not just who's committing crime, but who's being punished for committing yes. crime, and that's really where it's. So, um, the, the, what. Even an arrest. Yes. In effect yes. is a punishment. And, and I, I could. I could, I could certainly just, just so, and I know you will get asked this all, all the time, and that's why I brought copies of the National Academy of Sciences book, which is not quite as thick as the penal code, but it's also daunting in size. Um, one of the things we did was a very careful analysis of the relationship between incarceration and crime rates. And the conclusions that we reached is that the, that the reduction in crime over the last 30 to 40 years was, if at all, only in a very small way related to the massive increase in incarceration. And when you certainly, when you take into account what are called typically opportunity costs, what else we could have done with those funds, it was an unwise use of resources if our main purpose was to reduce crime. We could have done it much, much more effectively with an alternative use of those funds. So the, you know, the general and the, the sort of consensus of the people who analyze these kind of data is that about a quarter of the reduction in the crime rate uh, over the last 30 or so years is attributable to the 500% increase in the number of people who are incarcerated. So that give you a sense of the disproportionate, the, the ratio of, of really n not remotely commensurate outcome given the amount of, of the investment. But, and, uh, and there's also ways of looking at the, uh, the crime rate. The crime rate in the United States fluctuated wildly uh, during a period of time when we were incarcerating the most people. Uh, another, another, another statistic you can cite um, in response to this is, you know, one of the areas where we were most aggressive, we're less aggressive now, but where we were most aggressive over the last 30 to 40 years is in the prosecution of drug crimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nobody, no, nobody, no, no, no conservative criminologist even would argue that drug use <laughs> has decreased during the period of time that we increased by tenfold the number of people who we were putting in prison for drug offenses. So it gives you a sense that these two things are quite disconnected from, from, from one another. But now to get to your, to your other point, I, I, I fully agree. And in fact, sadly, the statistics that I showed you suggested, although California um, involuntarily, to a certain extent, significantly reduced the number of people in prison, we are still, we are still grappling with a, 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 a tragic disparity in racial and ethnic differences in terms of who is subject to jail and prison uh, incarceration. And I think that some of that gets addressed with the Assemblywoman's comments about subjectivity and taking life factors into account in sentencing. And I think what happens, I, I, my own analysis of this suggests that the reverse tends to, to occur, that, there, that, this, that, that racism in the criminal justice system involves an implicit stereotyping of who needs, who needs to be arrested, who needs to be prosecuted, who needs to, be, uh, who needs to get a recommendation for prison time, uh, and what that, what that recommendation ends up being, N not even going into what happens once they get into the prison system, w where, those, where those implicit and explicit biases also operate, sadly. And I think that, so some of it involves training to reverse that, those implicit biases, and, and in fact take into account the life circumstances of the people who are being, who are being sentenced. But, some, but, but, 
that's not going to do all of it. A lot of it gets to coming into the system in the first place. And that, I think, is, it, it is perhaps beyond the purview of this committee, but it is something that I think all of us who are interested in the reform of the criminal justice system have to keep at the forefront of what we advocate. If you don't come into the system, then the system can't harm you. Um, and getting at those decisions, those are not sentencing decisions, right. those are decisions about the gatekeepers uh, or by the gatekeepers. And, and I, you know, it's, it's a problem that, that plagues this state and other states, and we don't get genuine criminal justice reform until and unless we address that problem. Over here to your far right. Um, I just want to make one comment, and, and that is, although you did address the issue of lack of judicial discretion as a contributing factor to mass incarceration, I'd like to hear your thoughts on specific, for example, um, enhancements, sentencing enhancements, which really limit dis discretion, enhancements for the amount of drugs confiscated, weapons enhancements, and gang enhancements. But I have a question, and it's really not about that. Um, <clears throat> my question is, although you touched on uh, the rate of recidivist behavior as a contributing factor to the rate of incarceration, particularly in the state prison system, but I, th I would suggest it's also a problem in the county jail system, to what extent are we going to be able to, on this committee, um, make recommendations that, that will promote a, a real reform in um, reentry services and practices so that when people do get out, um, we can we can ensure that they don't come back to us. Well, I you know I don't know the answer to the question of the purview of the, of the committee, but if, if you're asking me, do I think that is an e extremely important component of what significant criminal justice reform has to look like? The answer is yes. I mean, I it ended with with a, with a quote from Joan Peter Celia about how important it is, not only to downsize the prison system, but then to advert to what happens to the people who were incarcerated, who aren't being incarcerated, or who were incarcerated, but who are now coming back. I mean, the, the issue of, of reentry, I think, is, 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 um, is, again, another significant component to criminal justice reform. Um, uh, communities all over the state are, are grappling with this. Um, I, I think it, it, it is the kind of thing that needs to be done with an influx of resources. I mean, these are not, this, this, this doesn't get done for free. Um, the, the quality of the services have to match the complexity of the issues and the problems, and people come out of prison. Um, off, you know, you saw the slides, you saw what it looks like. You can imagine the trauma that people leave prison with, trauma that many of them experienced before they went in, but that certainly was not adequately addressed, whether they're mentally ill or not. The, the trauma of incarceration is, is, is an important component to the reentry process. So, and it's one that we, t that we tend not to think about. We tend to think about, oh, wonderful, somebody's been released from prison. Now you have a chance to, to come back into the community and make it on your own. And in fact, they are bringing the psychic legacy of having been living, li lived in, in, in environments like the ones I, I showed you photographs of, not just for weeks or months, but for years. And you don't simply shed the effects of that um, because you're happy to be free. And that's a whole area of reentry that we've not spent really much time talking about. I, I don't mean us, but I mean the system doesn't spend very much time thinking about. It. We don't really invest much in the way of resources for that. If somebody comes out with a drug problem or a mental health problem, maybe they get services. But I would suggest to you that everybody coming out of prison is coming out of prison with bearing some trauma as a result of having lived in one of those environments for a period of years, and, and, and we need to give them some assistance with housing, with employment, um, counseling assistance if they, if they so choose, et cetera. And we, we really don't treat everybody as in need of those reentry services in the way that we should. I think I just have a brief, brief comment. I think one of the discussions we're going to have to have on this uh, committee is the, the scope of our work. I mean, it's a special committee on, uh, on the penal code. Yes. Uh, but a lot of the things we're talking about really involve societal mm -hmm. issues, budgetary issues, reentry issues. I don't even know if that's in, referred to in the penal code. I mean, diversion is, but reentry, recidivism, probation. probation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's all, all encompassing. Uh, 
so my my thinking is as I'm listening to the questions and, and to your presentation is we really have to to focus on particular provisions when when the governor was speaking you know he has to deal with the parole decisions where he has to consider whether or not someone should be released on parole and there's a body of law on his uh, authority and the authority of the Supreme Court to, to monitor that when I was on the court I wrote a number of I think important decisions on parole release decisions and and discretion you know one of the one of the regs that applies to parole is the severity of the offense well that never changes so that even if someone has been a model uh, prisoner and gotten degrees and completed all the programs when parole eligibility comes up and the uh, parole board or whoever's weighing the governor who's weighing the severity of the offense well that might just overwhelm everything else so that's the kind of thing I would like to focus on uh, because if we really take a broad view about all these society issues before people are arrested, everything that leads to that, uh, it's going to be a, an impossible task. Yes, uh, and then we just one final thing, I just wanted to comment. Peter and I have probably sentenced hundreds of people uh, to prison. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've never really felt, I agree with Peter uh, that I've always had a, I never really liked mandatory sentences whether as a federal judge or as a state judge. But in terms of guidelines, you know, the, 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 uh, the sentencing guidelines in federal court and also the determinative sentencing, I've always felt that as long as the, and I tell new judges this, they make a record. I mean, it's outlined for you as to what mm -hmm. is the appropriate sentence, probation, not probation, low term, midterm, uh, high term. Uh, I'm sure there are cases where uh, it would be very, very difficult, but I think the penal code currently gives you adequate guidelines apart from this mandatory mm -hmm. sentencing stuff for a court to make a reasoned uh, decision. And, you know, Judge Persky, who I know, uh, it's just, it happens. And even though a judge is acting completely within the law, the public and the media react completely differently. Mm -hmm. So I'm just speaking from experience in having to sentence people, and I think it's important that judges be given that discretion. Agreed. Agreed. I think they have it. Well, I'll keep this very short then because I wanted to respond to, yeah. to things that have been said, but the, especially with regard to the scope of, uh, of our committee and the committee's work. Um, that was the reason I asked the question about what can the penal code committee do when the discretion of police officers and prosecutors is what results in people coming into the system in the first place. Uh, but the, the, the question I had, if we still have time for questions, and if not, I want to throw it out there for purposes of what our work is, because we are limited in some ways in how we address the discretion of the people responsible for bringing everyone into the system in the first place. That's why I was wondering, what can we do with the penal code? You, you gave us some answers to that. The question really then relates to discretion as we've been talking about it, um, because the reason, uh, you know, historically when we think about the reason we moved to removing some of the discretion from judges when it came to, to sentencing was because of the enormous racial disparities that existed as a result, right? And so we moved to the other end to now limit discretion. Um, and it, it, if we use the federal system as an example, the problem, we already know all the problems, but I want to add an additional one because I'm curious what we can do here. In the federal system, with the sentencing guidelines that existed, that removed power from judges, gave it all to the prosecutors, one of the things it additionally did was not allow defense lawyers to talk about the very things that we would talk about in the capital mitigation case. Your background, the race, right? All the things that we thought, right, we needed to talk about. And so, it got stripped away, and yet by giving people too much discretion, we also it gets it's get back it gets back to Joan uh, Joan Pedersil. I can never Pedersil. pronounce her name. You know who I'm talking about? Yes, her statement about society, right? Because 
otherwise, given the implicit and explicit biases that continue to grow because of what our prison system looks like now, right? It, it, it justifies for people the biases we have because when you look, they say, look at it, right? Where the prisons are full of people of color, that means they are more criminal and everything we thought about them is really true. Um, so when it comes to discretion then, I don't know how, both in terms of when we look at the penal code, when we do give a lot of discretion to judges, when we do give a lot of discretion to, to jurors, when we do have over-criminalization, which gives more discretion to police officers and prosecutors because now they can choose from five different crimes. Mm -hmm. So if you're white, we'll choose the crime that results in no jail time. If you're a person of color, we'll choose the crime that results in the most jail time when we're, so I think there are things we can do within the scope of our committee, but it's complicated, right? And, and we might need to go through every single crime and say, let's get rid of all the extraneous ones yeah. to limit discretion, perhaps. But I, so I, I wanted to make that comment and then think about. Yeah, I, I'm going to follow up on that, and, I, and I'm going to frame it into a question because I think we're all. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, sure. Why don't, you why don't we start with that? Uh, so there's, a, you know, there's been a sh strong well, increase in the number of enhancements from guns to race to. Games. It is, it is yeah. one of the ways in which we filled the prisons. You know, you know, you know the, the, those numbers I showed you are, are the consequence of a variety of different changes that were made in the penal code, m sometimes criminalizing things that hadn't been criminal, sometimes increasing the length of the sentences for the specific crime, and then a whole panoply of enhancements that could be introduced you know, some of which, not all of which, but some of which also contributed to the racial disparities that we've been talking about. Gang enhancements, for example. The number, you know, the number of people who are serving extra time, significantly extra time, because of some vague allegation of some, uh, of an unreliable uh, categorization uh, as a gang member, um, or it's an enormous number of people. So these things have all been knitted together to create a very punitive, a very punitive system, and so yes, I think that's part of what I hope your committee would would be able would be able to look at um, how those things have been used, who they're affecting, whether or not you know on the issue of parsimony and proportionality, do you real do you really need this enhancement, and and exactly is this enhancement proportional to whatever it is that is that it is designed to accomplish, or 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 whatever it is designed to to respond to. So I think that's a, a, a very important com component of this. The only, and I don't know if you wanted to ask a question about the racial issue or you wanted me to respond. I was to gonna get to the uh, discretion Did piece. You, okay. uh, first, I want to rehabilitate uh, Peter's reputation a bit and to say <laughs> that he may, have, he may have sentenced many people to prison, but uh, he also freed uh, my very first client who was okay. serving a nonviolent life sentence. Uh, so. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, and I affirm those. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have one sort of global question as we try to th thread this needle about discretion and but keeping guardrails on to avoid the, same, the problems that we had in the beginning. And then a, a, a pretty specific question that I hope that you can answer. Um, so the, I think that a lot of people who've given more than 10 minutes of thought to criminal justice have really thought hard about indeterminate sentencing, the change to determinate sentencing laws. We've even, like in the first, you know, our very first meeting, are really starting to dig in on that. Um, of course, we've also recognized that it was eliminated for a problem, you know, a lot of the biases that, that snuck in. Um, and the more subjectivity you interject to the system, the more likely you're gonna have a bias. Also, the two most successful reforms that you described, you know, realignment and Prop 47, stripped discretion away, right? So they were anti-discretion -discre bills, um, and you say that they've been worked, they've worked pretty, pretty well. Um, so how, so this is the sort of the global question. Do you have any insight or any hunches as to how to thread that needle between giving discretion and individualized consideration of people's circumstances and crimes while cabining um, either keeping biases out, keeping disproportionality out, um, 
and keeping the Persky situations from happening again? Is there a way to, to cabin discretion? Well, I would, I would say two, two things. First of all, yes, um, realignment and Proposition 47 did uh, limit discretion, but it limited discretion downwardly. Right. So, I, and I think that's an important principle to keep in mind. Um, the, 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 the concern about, I think, what, with, the, what the, with the criminal justice system, the real concern is, uh, from my perspective, a system that punishes too much, unjustifiably so. So I think the pressure in the system is always to, to go in that direction, not the other direction. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's been our experience over the last 30 to 40 years. We have a system where when, when discretion has been made available, with very, very rare exceptions, which is why we can name them, uh, that, 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 that the tendency has been to misuse discretion in, in a way that is more rather than less punitive. Um, the other thing I would say, uh, and, and maybe this is naive, and I hope, it, I hope it's not, and I hope it's not Pollyannish, but I, I think we are, as a society, uh, and certainly this state, in a different place now in 2020 than we were uh, some years ago when we were concerned about the abuse of discretion in, 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 in judicial sentencing and even in the system at, at large. I think there is a, we now know much more about how prejudice and bias works. We know much more about the importance of accountability, about, about keeping data. You know, there are, there are states have passed so-called racial justice acts where their, their system is regularly evaluated on the basis of whether or not there are racial disparities in the decision-making process. That's something that's, that was unheard of in the 1970s when we began to reduce the discretion that the system operated with. We were, I think, we had a very, excuse the expression, we had a kind of primitive grasp of what racism looked like in the criminal justice system in the 1960s and 70s. We certainly knew it was there, and we were taking steps to try to address it. But I think there's a, we have a much more sophisticated analysis of it now. We have a better understanding of where the points of discretion are, where racial and ethnic bias can come into play. We have the, at least the opportunity to have training programs and to have oversight on, and at those decision-making points that, that nobody envisioned in the 1970s. So I'm, I, I think we're in a different position to do these things better and more effectively. At least that's my reading. At least I hope that's the case. So that we, and, and we certainly are in a position to collect the data and analyze the data and understand where we've fallen short in ways that we were simply not able to, weren't even really considering doing in the late 60s and early 1970s. I, I think I share your position on the data and the use of the data. I'm less uh, optimistic about what's actually going on in court just from my own experience. You know, this last week and last month and last year, it's not changed as much as I think. Um, I was curious quickly, uh, what, what role do you think uh, algorithms and risk protocols, are they helpful or are they just, uh, is that inviting a whole new batch of problems? I, 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 the only, you know, the, again, this is an unhelpful answer. It depends. I mean, they, they, you know, as you know, and I suspect this is implied in your question, you know well that they, they oftentimes mask. It's another way of neutralizing bias. It's another way of, it's another way of taking the real social justice issue out of the equation uh, and some, and ironically, oftentimes it ends up punishing the very people that the algorithm is supposed to protect. And so I think it, uh, you know, as a, uh, you know, as a general matter, it, it would, it depends entirely on how it's being used. What is the algorithm? Is there a way to introduce more subjectivity, uh, as the assemblywoman says, into uh, uh, social justice oriented subjectivity into the analysis? Very few algorithms that I know are able to do that in an effective way. Okay, and my last question is, all right, we've talked about here in past half hour, you know, policing, even pre-policing, sentencing, very long sentences, touched on the death, the whole gamut, right? And I think we were all feeling a little bit daunted by uh, our task, and today is day one. And so um, this, is, this, is this, well, this is the specific question, I, and I want you to, try not to dodge it, uh. which is, if you were really, where would you recommend that we start? I would, I would recommend that you 
take whatever steps you can take to reduce the number of people who enter the prison system. Prisons, not jails. Prison, well, well, both. I mean, I mean, you're, the jail. The, well, the jail decision is is more complicated. I try. I mean, I've tried to be. You know, we've talked a lot about what is your purview, and you know, from my perspective, you know, you, if I were on the committee, and I suspect some members are going to feel the same way, I'd be trying to expand that purview as much as, much as possible because this is an interconnected system, and we, you know, we as much as 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 much Our as we would like to say. Both. Our penal code puts you either in jail or prison. Yes, exactly. So I mean, it, 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 it's and you know, we've, as we've talked now at, at, at some length, and I think thoughtfully, decisions that get made that don't have anything to do with the penal code really, really do affect whether or not somebody ends up in how, and how many people end up in prison. So, so just to keep as narrow a focus as I can, what I know is is certainly within your purview. Um, I would say I would say reduce the number of people who are subjected to being put in prison. Jail is a little bit more complicated, um, but but certainly jail is a secondary concern. The, the, the sheer numbers of people who are touched by this system to the extent to which that can be reduced and the length of time. We, we just touched a little bit on that. We talked a little bit about enhancements and so on. The lengths of time are, and even the governor referred to this, I mean the lengths of time that we have come to sentence people to. In, in this state and others, we're not, we're not alone in this, but what has happened over the last 30 to 40 years, the way you swell a prison system is not only by putting lots and lots of people in there who wouldn't have been in there in, in the first place or wouldn't have been in there before, but you keep them there for a very long period of time. Um, and, 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 th and this includes, frankly, and uh, you know, this is unpopular, but I you know, I know you've all thought about it and, and, and are prepared to address it. We're talking not just about non, non, non offenses. We, we really sentence people who've committed what are currently called violent crime to lengths of time that no other modern democracy does. And, we've, and it's become normative. It's become normative to think about, again, I think back when I was first beginning in this kind of work, the average amount of time that somebody spent in prison for having committed murder was less than 20 years. I mean, it, it, it was almost unheard of for anybody to go to prison for longer than 20 years. I mean, you, some of you I know know this directly, but you know, your, European countries, um, the, whatever <laughs> the worst possible crime you can commit, they simply cap the amount of time that somebody gets sentenced to prison. And it's based on a very, I think, a very rational data-driven understanding of there is absolutely no purpose served to keep a person in prison for a longer period of time than the, than the normative times that they work with, far shorter than the amount of time that we do. You'll see in the National Academy of Sciences analysis of this issue of deterrence, the one thing that everybody on that committee agreed on was that long prison sentences are counterproductive. Long prison sentences for any kind of crime are counterproductive. Now, there, there may be a, 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 a symbolic necessity for some of it, I, I won't, I, you know, that I'll, I'll leave you to deliberate that. But in terms of the actual amounts of time which people are spending in prisons in California and elsewhere in the United States, there is no modern Western democracy that is remotely close to that. And that, I think, is something that is very important to keep, to keep, to keep in mind. All right. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Senator Skinner, and I'll leave you the last word. Thank you. Um, I appreciate that perspective. I think my and again, this will obviously evolve as we continue through our process, but my kind of in conclusion of what we've heard today, our discussion, our comments is that the governor was right to give us the assignment of penal code review and that we, and that in that penal code review, clearly we have to look at the discretion because that was part of the penal code changes, <coughs> but clearly also about what crimes were added, enhancements, lengths of sentences, and that I would um, recommend that we, in focusing on that, not so much, it's not that we never will, but not so much make the distinction about whether change X or Y put the person affected into a state prison or a county jail, but rather that we're looking at just trying to um, reform or correct that penal code to more reflect 
the principles that were. And, and the reason I bring that up is because I would recommend that we not necessarily just focus on those parts of the penal code that put you in a state prison because in, if we do so, we haven't addressed that the, while the realignment changes have been very good for a reduction in our state prisons, there is not a lot of evidence that the time you serve in a county jail, especially now that the time served has become longer, is benefiting either the individual in that jail or the society, the neighborhood, or the community in terms of public safety or well-being. And so that's why I don't so much want to kind of focus only on, all right, let's look at sentences that will reduce our state prison population, but rather let's just look at whether our, our penal code and our sentencing structure is achieving the public safety objectives and the principles that we're trying to achieve. Yes. Um, I, I also hope that we can really sort of look and analyze the pure intent of the penal code. Um, what it's designed to do and sort of what maybe it has sort of metastasized into and see if we can sort of cut away some of the excess. And I hope that while we're doing these things that we're also actually looking at things like Penal Code 1000 and looking at pretrial diversion and figuring out where there are opportunities in the code that we can utilize and expand. Ultimately, I think we're sort of all talking about the inconsistencies within the code and how to minimize those so that it's equitable in how we are distributing punishment and also equitable in how we're distributing rehabilitation, reentry, you know, and access to success. And I have to hope that that is also part of the intent of the code. But I think if it's not, in our discussions, we have to acknowledge that it is and then maybe figure out if we think we believe that it should be, figure out how to insert that into it. Agreed. Um, well, thank you, Professor Haney. I hope we can continue to call on you as we walk down this road, I mean, either formally or informally. As I said, you've been a real inspiration and hero to me from the beginning of my career. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate um, your time here today. Thank you. Pleasure. Yes, yes. No, there's plenty. I have, I have one at home. So it's, um, yeah, party. We'll, we'll, we'll get you more. Yeah. Um, all right. Craig, do you need help? Uh, no, I think just I tangling can, I, that. Can do. Yeah. Um, all right, I'd like to move on to the part of the agenda, which is to cover some of the administrative matters that we need to talk about, um, and also involving scheduling and other matters that Brian will take the lead from here. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> there were three memoranda that were distributed, posted to the website, all addressing administrative matters. Um, I could present them in five minutes if you're all content with them, um, but it's also perfectly fine to have as much discussion as you want about the content of any. Um, the only limitation being a hard limitation that we're agendized through two o'clock, so we can't proceed past that time. And a softer one is that we have a lunch reservation at one. Uh, maybe too optimistic. Um, the first memo, 2021, um, presents a draft of an operating handbook. As it explains, uh, the Law Revision Commission has uh, developed a handbook that serves as sort of a memorialization of its operating practices. Um, it's a source of institutional memory um, and it's, you know, something that we can uh, touch back on if we run into operating questions. Um, the, the commission's statutory mandate and procedures are, uh, I think, going to be substantially different than this committee's, although there are a lot of similarities as well. Um, so I worked closely with the chairman in advance of this meeting to take the commission's handbook and modify and prune it to make it more suitable for the committee's use. And that's the document that you have attached to the first memorandum. So ultimately the decision that's called for in connection with this memo is whether you are comfortable approving this handbook 
uh, for present purposes, understanding that it's completely subject to modification going forward since it's just a memorialization of your own present uh, decisions, um, and whether you want to make any changes to it. And I'm also happy to, if you have specific questions about any part of it, to answer them. No questions? Looked great to me. All right. I, I, should say, I should say that we've benefited tremendously from Brian and Barbara's institutional knowledge from working on the Law Revision Commission. For the past several months, they've been doing a lot of this administrative work where they've been incredibly helpful. So uh, I guess I would move to adopt uh, the, the handbook as it is. Second. Anybody opposed? Okay. So okay. it's Thank approved. You. And part, uh, part of the Open Meeting Act is that we're required in our minutes to record every vote. And that includes uh, people who happen to be out of the room when the vote uh, takes place or who abstain. So in addition to hearing your assent to it, if anyone ever wants to abstain from a vote, please let me know because we need to note that. Um, the second memo, 2022, is just about scheduling the meetings for 2020. Um, I, I came up with a proposed set of dates uh, based on a number of factors. One is the provisional decision of the chair that he'd like to hold two-day meetings and my understanding that Thursday, Fridays are easier for two-day meetings for our legislative members than other days of the week. Um, also, it's worth noting that Thursday afternoons are going to be much easier than Thursday mornings for legislative members because they're in session on Thursday mornings. Um, I also tried to schedule so as not to create conflicts with the Law Revision Commission scheduled meeting dates uh, and be easier for Barbara and I to attend uh, if we're not also required to be at those other meetings at the same time. Um, and so hopefully these dates will work for you. You know, they're, they're pushed out several months, but if not, we can talk about changing any of them. That would be great. Dates that I hope we can change. Do we have the date? I mean, are, are not good for you. Okay, why don't you? So deal with March 1st. Um, March 12th first. We could move that meeting forward or back by a week. I could live with moving it back, not forward. Well, yeah. Anyone have a, a hard conflict with the 19th and 20th of March? I think I do. But I won't know until then. No, I do have a, a conflict. Uh, well, would you be able to elect some telephonic? Telephonic is very difficult because the Open Meeting Act requires that we notice the other location that you'd be calling in from and hold it open for public participation at that site. Even though it's the committee meeting, uh, Correct. Yeah, any kind of teleconferencing, both ends have to be open meetings. I wonder if on the, the conflict, the March 12th, 13th, I realize we are trying to set up two days, but if we retained the 13th, if that addressed the conflict that people have raised, then it wouldn't be two days, but at least we might have the full 13th. I think it's just me, and what I can try to do with the 12th, what time would we be starting on those days? We, we haven't that degree of specificity yet, although let me say, the chair's suggestion is that the first day of each two-day meeting be an information gathering day rather than deliberations, and we're intending to live stream these meetings. So it might be possible if you can't make the informational day, you could speed watch it before the next day. Right, okay. <laughs> so I, I wanted to raise that in the Thursdays, right now it appears only to be the 12th and 30th, um, due to my chairship of the budget subcommittee, our hearings are on the Thursday immediately after session. Okay. And so they are sometimes concluded 
by, for example, 3 p.m. or even 2 p.m., though not always. So at least on any Thursday, and I'm happy to hear it's primarily informational, I would not be able to attend until my budget subcommittee concluded. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, the other dates um, will work. So that's for all Thursdays or just? Well, it isn't for the July 30th and, well, June 11th and 12th will already be in budget adoption mode. On the July 30th and 31st, we'll be out of session. And then September and November, we're out of session. So that's why it's not a problem in any of those other times. But the June 11th and 12th is just a few days before our constitutional deadline. Of budget adoption. So we could be, So we could yes. potentially be here Correct, correct. Right. To be. Sure. Are you familiar with doodle polls? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that might be survey monkey. Yeah. yeah. Can we, is that subject to, can we do that by? I have never had to know whether the Open Meeting Act applies to the kind of ministerial things that involved its scheduling. I'm seeing skepticism from a former justice of the Supreme Court, <laughs> which I take as at least persuasive. Okay, so shall we uh, postpone this discussion? Okay. Yes, we're gonna do this electronic. Okay, okay I'm gonna, great. <laughs> I, I'm ruling, I, I'm deciding that we're gonna do the scheduling matters electronically. We're not gonna discuss any substance in those electronic okay. communications except for meeting schedule. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Okay, Perfect. okay. But I think knowing, because it obviously will be hard to come up with the schedule that all of us are gonna be, but knowing that the first day was informational, thus we might be able to send um, yeah. a yeah. staff or other representative to be to observe, to be able to brief us after, that it seems that what we'd want to try to achieve is to make sure we're all available for the substantive parts of the meeting. That, 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 sounds, that sounds right. And as I've discussed with all of you, um, we're starting from scratch. And, you know, I'm trying to develop a, a schedule and and structure that is, you know, efficient, but also gets a lot of work done. We have, you know, as we, a lot to do. And I hope, I think this two-day process will work, but if it turns out to be too burdensome or not efficient for whatever reason, we can always change that. But for the scheduling purposes, let's try this year to do the two-day meetings. Sound good? All right. Um, so the last memo, uh, 03 is just information only. Uh, some of you uh, may not have been executive branch officials before, so it's just a rundown of some of the more important laws that govern the operations of bodies like this. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say one of the most significant ones is the Open Meeting Act, and the most significant aspect of that act is the prohibition on communicating outside of. Uh, official meetings, and that includes informal communication serially or through an intermediary, um, which is why I, and the hesitation about the scheduling offline. Um, another thing that I think is uh, important and not obvious and recent um, has to do with the Public Records Act, which is the decision uh, in the city of San Jose case that the Public Records Act applies to communications on your personal communication devices using your own accounts. So if you're doing committee business using your own communication service, that is potentially disclosable under the Public Records Act. Um, so bear that in mind. Uh, the Law Revision Commission sort of prophylactically adopted a policy of minimizing those kinds of communications on unofficial devices and services. Um, in anticipation of the headaches that could result if we get a public records request, as we might, um, involved in sort of canvassing all the members and asking you to marshal relevant materials and forward them to us. But it's not impossible. Um, it's just something to be mindful of. Uh, maybe try to minimize unofficial communication services for committee business, and, or if you do use them, segregate them for easy retrieval or CC staff, because then it's on a, an official commission account that's easily found. That's a good idea. Did anyone have any questions about the content, anything in that memo? Okay. One question. Yeah. So 
um, for those of us who are legislators, our other activity is governed under Laura. So I just want to make sure I understand this. So that my activity here is now governed under Public Records Act versus under Laura. I believe it is, yeah. Okay. Laura meaning the Legislative Open Records Act, which has different provisions. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. Oh, and another thing, this is in the, in the materials that my administrative analyst should have sent you or that I gave you today. Um, the clock is ticking now that you've been oathed on filing a Form 700 with the FPPC. What's the deadline? 30 days after assuming office, which is today. Uh, yeah, information about there should, should be in the packet. Yeah. Well, let me see if I can find that. Um, well, I think I could read it and you, you could. Uh, so yeah, the, the disclosure under uh, the Form 700 is governed by combining the statutory disclosure categories with any limitations imposed by the agency's conflict of interest code. We're in the process of revising our conflict of interest code to create a new category for this committee. Um, and the language is on page 10 of memo three. You would disclose all investments, interests in real property, income, including gifts, loans, travel payments, and business positions. That's the statutory part that foreseeably may be materially affected by a decision of the Committee on Revision of the Penal Code. So the intention there is just to limit the materiality to the work that you're doing here. Are there any other questions? All right, I don't know. Well, first of all, I want to recognize that some uh, of my students are here. Um, <laughs> yeah. So. Um, Stanford has graciously allowed uh, us to use students and give credit at the law school to be part of a policy lab who will help do some research for us along the way. So can you guys raise your hand? Thank you. Um, and uh, we have a, uh, some time for a public comment period. If there's anybody here who would like to address the committee, first, Senator Skinner. Um, Chair, I wondered, uh, I just wanted to recognize that in the back of the room is the consultant to our Senate Public Safety Committee, Mary Kennedy, who has been play, who has been in that role, <laughs> been in that role for more than two, been in a role in that committee. How many years? Twenty-five years. Yeah. So, in other words, um, amongst we will obviously have many experts to draw upon, but as she is. Um, had to analyze or at least process many of these changes to the penal code that the legislature enacted since most of them, while some were enacted by proposition, many by the legislature. Um, she will be attending most of our meetings and so is a resource we can draw on. Terrific, thank you, Mary. So is there anybody that would like to address the committee? Going once. Um, all right, so I think we are adjourned. Um, not there, until you bang the gavel, I'm but, bang the gavel. but let me. Uh, one gonna... other point that maybe wasn't obvious is that there is another member of the committee, Senator John Burton, and I spoke with him. He wasn't able to attend this meeting. The shortness of the interval didn't allow it, but uh, we'll be uh, meeting with him privately just to get him oriented, and then I expect him to be at future meetings. Yes. I have a question. At some point, will we talk about? or learn about kind of homework and what that means and how we get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, my, my, my real job. Um, yes, so uh, let, let's back up a half step about how we've thought about s scheduling. And um, I think that this, it, it is such a massive task, right? And to try to bring some order, at least to the first year, what we decided to do was to spend our five substantive meetings, right, the six a year, and uh, um, kind of marching through the schedule of a typical criminal case. So our idea is that our, first, our next meeting will talk about policing and alternatives to incarceration and 
and um, things that happen at the beginning stages of a case. Then we'll move towards sentencing and eventually towards reentry services. So trial, sentence, what happens in prison, and at the end. Um, of course, that's subject to amendment at any time. The idea is that uh, ahead of those, each of those um, meetings, we will, the staff will primarily, um, but your input would be super helpful, um, identify witnesses who would come and talk and brief us on those areas. Um, we're going to set, we're going to ask them to write, to provide written testimony with strict page limits so we're not all overwhelmed. Um, which the staff will then summarize and circulate ahead of the meetings, along with any additional research that the staff might think would be relevant towards those particular um, hearings or meetings. Um, we have not yet settled on how far in advance that would be. Um, I think that in general what would be helpful is relatively short memos attached to longer articles or more in-depth information. Um, and again, this is a work in progress, so um, you know I will do my best to communicate with Brian and with Tom primarily as to what I think would be most helpful. But if you guys have ideas or thoughts or reactions, let's you know get that together. But does that seem to make sense? There's no open meeting prohibition on you communicating directly with staff. So if you ever have questions or suggestions, <laughs> you could reach out to me or any of the others. And I believe that. You can communicate with, individuals can communicate with each other, but we can't communicate as a majority of the committee. Yeah. All right, so we can't, so four people can't communicate together. All right. Um, okay, with, unless there's anything more that anybody needs to say. I will, I have not collected all of them apparently, but. All right, I'm gonna formally, we're formally, we're formally adjourned. If you have any paperwork that needs to go back to the governor's office, I can take that and distribute it for you. <laughs>